2020 marks 75 years since the end of World War II. As time churns on, it's important to never forget the destruction and countless lives lost in the years of global conflict. And one way to keep the past alive is by preserving the stories of those who served. One of the largely untold perspectives comes from the women working in the Office of Strategic Services, a government espionage organization which played a vital role in winning the war. The OSS was America's first intelligence agency, and it essentially consisted of an estimated 13,000 military and civilian personnel who served in the OSS during World War II. And I should follow that up with the fact that roughly a third of the members of the OSS were women, and a lot of them in roles that were not traditionally available in general and specifically to women. That's Katie S. Sanders, a freelance journalist and World War II history buff. She says the OSS division of almost 13,000 Americans was quite different compared to most other sectors of the military. It was more of a wartime experiment that consisted of an eclectic group of people, including academics, scientists, actresses, even convicts. You may be familiar with the American chef Julia Child, but did you know that she was part of the OSS? She actually was too tall. She tried to sign up for the Navy to be in the Women's Navy unit, and she was rejected on account of being above six feet. And as a result of that, she had some connections to people who were working with OSS. And she really, they were looking for people who were, they called them PhDs who could win at a bar fight. They were people who were sort of, in some ways, not afraid to push traditional boundaries. Uh, and Julia Child, in particular, really fit this adventure-seeking, spirited operative who they could look to. Um, and she actually, she worked directly in support of General Donovan, the founder and father of the OSS and now the CIA. And the story that people love to tell, which has some truth to it, is that she had to rig up and try to come up with a recipe this was before she cooked for shark repellent for Navy men who were being eaten alive in the Pacific by sharks or at risk of being eaten by sharks. OSS recruit Virginia Stewart remembers working with Julia Child during the war and says that Child was not so focused on cooking back then. They worked in the registry together in Kunming, China, said, oh, yes, I knew Julia. She couldn't even, I don't even think she could make a cup of tea back then. Working in the OSS meant being part of an ever-changing agency that required its staff to work in whatever capacity required. This sometimes meant becoming a spy, propagandist, or assisting in various types of administrative intelligence behind enemy lines or back in the U.S. There's stories like Virginia Hall, the lipping lady, who one of her famous, uh, she was a French OSS operative, dropped into France, or boated into France because she had one leg, she had an amputated leg, and one of her famous disguises was as an old woman in France, in that she managed to get around with people. At one point, they were saying that she was one of the most dangerous people in France against the SS and the Gestapo, but... By dressing like an old woman, she made herself less threatening. So they really, the OSS looked for diversity, and that was diversity of age, of race, of gender. And in a lot of ways, they also didn't really care. It was very non-hierarchical in the traditional sense of the military. Last year, Sanders separately sat down with two women, Marion A. Frieswick and Virginia Stewart, who both worked for the OSS during World War II. Now, both in their late 90s, they say that back then, choosing to serve in the OSS was not a choice, but a revered duty. It was just what you did. Uh, both Virginia and Marion are very clear that they don't view themselves as a deviation from anyone else who was hearing of the sweeping news of the world being in this war and trying to figure out where they could bring their talents and strengths. I think we forget how much on the brink of war on our land as well as you know throughout the world in a really destructive genocidal way americans felt you've listened to fdr on your radio and that was what you were hearing and come the news of pearl harbor you know virginia and marion both you know it was very much appropriate normal thing to do rather than say i'm going to go into fashion or be a teacher it was like 
who are you making clothes for? What students are you teaching? You know, it was very much a question of how do we even ensure that we have future generations can have those things. Fighting in World War II was in part to ensure the freedom of future generations. With this in mind, every capable person, man or woman, pitched into the war effort. Marion Frieswick was a 21-year-old graduate student at Clark University when she was recruited by the OSS. Sanders says Frieswick is the last surviving member of the original OSS mapping division. Her role during the war was as a cartographer, a person who produces intricate maps. The mapping team would often be instrumental in quickly creating 3D layouts of the war terrain for leaders planning an invasion. They had millions of maps that they collected. OSS sent people around to, you know, civilians around situations where they could go around the world and collect maps, and they created this insane library. And then it was up to um, cartographers like Marion and her team to actually create new maps and map things that would really inform intelligence and special operations in the same way that they do today, although more digitally today. On the other hand, Virginia Stewart's role in the OSS consisted of entirely different responsibilities. At just 22 years old, she was part of a secret communications team in Washington, D.C. that sorted through confidential reports and documents coming from field agents around the world. People tasked with organizing this intelligence had to act quickly and learn how to prioritize in order to move communication through the correct channels. Stewart worked hard in her role and was able to move up within the ranks to be transferred overseas. It was important but tedious, and to get past that, she really felt like she could contribute abroad and made that clear to her supervisor, who was a woman, and the supervisor supported her uh, in going to shorthand writing class and come the time to you know, bring some personnel from Washington who were well-trained in registry work to other theaters. Uh, she was off to Europe and then to Asia as well. Stewart was also stationed in Egypt and China on assignment and helped out wherever she was needed until the war's end in 1945. For Stewart, working for the OSS during the war instilled in her a lifelong wanderlust for travel. She went and lived in Honduras and she had a really interesting life after OSS and while she did have a few points where she would reflect on it, it was never done publicly. And Marion's the same way. And these are women who were glad to have done their part to ensure that we live in a democracy. It was a reminder, a staunch reminder to be more keenly aware of the delicate nature of how we're all connected. The Office of Strategic Services was a wartime effort. So when the conflict ended in 1945, President Truman officially dissolved the organization. However, the success of the OSS and its diverse makeup of both men and women proved the importance of government intelligence in the United States. From this, the CIA was formed in 1947, and in its ranks were many previous employees of the OSS, including Marion Frieswick. You can find out more about the Office of Strategic Services, World War II, and KDS Sanders at viewpointsradio.org. You can also check out Sanders' website at kdssanders.com. Also follow Viewpoints Radio on Twitter and Instagram for more behind the scenes. This segment is written and produced by Amira Zaveri. I'm Gary Price. Our schedules are incredibly hectic, and with all the things we have to do, there's not enough time for the things we actually want to do. That's why it's more important than ever to find smart ways to save time without sacrificing quality. How can Idahoan mashed potatoes give you more time to spend doing the things you love? By helping you put delicious real mashed potatoes on the table in just five minutes. We start with 100% real Idaho potatoes from local growers, and then we wash, peel, boil, and mash them just like you would at home. After cooking each batch, we simply fresh dry the mashed potatoes so they're ready for you to prepare at home. Idahoan takes the time to create great tasting mashed potatoes from scratch so you don't have to. Find out more at idahoan.com. That's idahoan.com.
And that's Viewpoints for this week. Viewpoints is a production of Media Tracks Communications. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram to learn more about upcoming shows. And find a library of past programs on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spotify. Plus, you'll always find previous segments and more information about our guests at viewpointsradio.org. Join us again next week for another edition of Viewpoints. Coming up next week. How are the Keithleys or anybody else who are otherwise law-abiding, good people, getting whacked with the same consequences as, say, a drug dealer or murderer might face? How one voting mistake led to years of anxiety over possible deportation. Then... Engineering, programming, finance, medicine, everything. Behind the scenes, it's all math, it's numbers. But what happens when someone messes up the math? I'm Marty Peterson. And I'm Gary Price. These stories in-depth on your public affairs magazine, Viewpoints.